<laughs> Happy anniversary, darling. Happy anniversary. Aren't you glad we came back to the Keys? Yeah. I'm just sorry it's only for a week. Mm, me too. But I really lose track of time here. Mm. I know. I'm fully conscious that I'm dead. I've grown quite used to this existence. Though I don't recognize this body of water in which I am now dissolved, I drift and drift. And I am that in which I drift. There was darkness at first, but then I rose, became some faint current from the depths of the North Atlantic. And the beach was incredible today. And swimming's not the only thing you can do on water. <laughs> Admit it. Haven't you always wanted to try a water bed? Yeah. I'm going to perfect my breaststroke. <laughs> <laughs> You're disgusting. Mm. Mm. There is something overhead. Swimmers, perhaps. After many years, mm. I don't know how many... There are still surprises awaiting me. The thrashing above me. The agitation it brings upon me. And this impulse now to shape words. For thrashing, the idea of thrashing returns me to that night when the great stillness was succeeded by mortal movement everywhere. Returns me to the North Atlantic when I was upon it, not of it. Keep your dignity. What is that? I don't know. I'm frightened too, but we mustn't sniffle. Think of what we survived. Think of the dead. Look, there's a lifeboat. They're all women. They're radio the ship. Let's get them aboard. Do you see their clothes? They look like something out of Master Beast Theater. Yeah. Oh, it must have been a costume party. Maybe some cruise ship sank. Air hanging in this hotel room. It feels like the North Atlantic. Not nearly so cold as that, really, but but so surprisingly cold on this hot summer day that it has the same shock to it as the air on that night, where the greater part of me continues to dwell. There is a place on the wall where the air is rushing in. It feels like a gash there. A place ripped open by ice. The sound of hammering and thrashing of air woke me from a deep, dreamless sleep. <laughs> well, I naturally expected to find myself in the ice field on the morning of April 15, 1912. But overhead was a great, dark machine hovering. <laughs> I thought of the Martians. And then a great ship eased up to us. And I knew we had somehow passed into a future time. I'm very weary. Yes? Come in. Hello. I'm Roberta Fox from The Post. It's good of you to see me. Oh, my father was a newspaper man. I understand the need to account for the unaccountable. Thank you. Well, they say I must tell my story. I told them I would see one journalist, a woman. On the ship, the one that rescued us, a... A woman introduced herself as Captain O'Brien. And I thought then that women have achieved much of what we fought for. Well... Well, from what I understand, and, uh, and I understand is a relative word now, I understand I was, I was plucked out of a place in the seas that apparently is notorious for mysteries. The Bermuda Triangle, yes. And this place is, uh, is far from the fatal ice field where we sank. And I have outlived by many years everyone I ever knew. I've ordered tea. That at least feels familiar. Real. May I offer you some? Oh, thank you. With a little milk, please? Mm -hmm. What do you mean, real? Well, everything else has the quality of a dream. I fled the ship and fell into a deep sleep. And now 
I am alone. I know, it does seem unbelievable. Titanic survivors being rescued in the year 2000. But I've spoken to the Coast Guard, and I'm not here to ridicule you. I just want to hear your story, your feelings, anything you want to tell me. My, uh, my feelings? Yes, may I start the tape? Tape? Oh, of course you wouldn't. It records your voice, it, like a, like a phonograph. Oh, yes. Uh, technology is very advanced now, I, I gather from what I have seen. I've been watching the, uh, the television. I can imagine the headlines my father would have printed. Window on the world in every home. <laughs> Horses disappear from roads replaced universally by racing cars. Mathematical genius transferred to tiny machine. <laughs> Perhaps ships no longer sink. If you mean, have we triumphed over death, no. Tell me about that night, April 14th, 1912. Cold. I was so cold in the lifeboat. And before me was this, was this vast interruption of the sea. Of the night, a blaze in a thousand places with spots of light. And the smoke still slithered up from its stacks. And for a moment, the light struck me as, as the lives still there on the boat. And then the smoke struck me as the souls of those lives. Departing already. I could feel them. Those desperate souls. Though in fact there was no one dead yet, probably, unless... Unless it were some poor engine room workers whom the vast jagged wall of ice sought out at once. Go on. Do you know what happened then? No, not, not really. And now I am, I am in this room in Washington, D.C. In a place and time as foreign to me as the planet Mars. Which I read as a teenager has canals in civilized life. I believed it. So if I can believe there is life on Mars, then why am I still so slow in believing in the reality of this hotel room? It must seem very strange. <laughs> well, it is foolish. But I am afraid of this room. For it has this gash, and the cold air pours in, and, and I worry that the room will fill and, and it will sink. I love you. You too, honey. We should come back here every year. Oh, you're right. It's our place. Mm. I think I heard the sound of a human voice above me in this strange place. Mm. <laughs> I cannot make out the words. It's been a rare thing for me in all this time to sense that a living human being might be close by. On that dark night in the North Atlantic, at the very moment we struck our fate out somewhere beneath the waterline on our bow, I was in the midst of voices. <laughs> well oh, my God, sir. Is that how you fellows play cards in New York? <laughs> I shall have to look sharp. Oh, not at all. <laughs> Just a lucky hand, I guess. How about another whiskey to lessen the pangs, eh? Just the ticket. Oh, it's coming on half past eleven. This is getting too rich for my blood. If I'm not careful, I'll be in steerage by morning. <laughs> what about you, sir? Care to sit in? Uh, no, thank you. I am an indifferent card player. Odd. I believe the ship has stopped. Really? Oh, this is an amazing ship. You've read the newspapers, I suppose. She represents the last word in man's triumph over the elements. It's the age of technology, eh? Yes, of course. Doubtless it's nothing serious. But I'll see what's the matter. Oh, come down. Let me win my money back. <laughs> all right, all right. Good luck. I rose and stepped out under the wrought iron and glass dome of the aft staircase. I had no apprehensions. That seems a bit naive now, of course, but at the time I was straight from the leather chair of the first-class smoking lounge, and my views had been formed by the civil service in India. My notion of acute peril was the threat of native rebellion. I was reading in my cabin a book by Edith Wharton about a man married to a, a shrewish woman and in love with his wife's cousin. Ethan Frome. Mm -hmm. And I heard the, the 
the sound and felt the faint hesitation in this great beast of a ship. I put my book down and I was instantly angry. Why? They had appeared in the newspapers in London, an array of mustachioed men with derbies saying that this, this ship was the technological wonder of the age, a testament to man's power over the elements, a vast machine, greater than any in history, and indestructible, unsinkable. <laughs> I'd known even then that it was all an age-old lie. There was no one about on the staircase except for a steward who rushed past me and down the steps. Uh, what's the trouble? Nothing, sir. A lady's called for a hot water bottle. Cold feet, I presume. I descended the steps and went out onto the open promenade. The night was very still. There were people moving about somewhat distractedly, but I paid them no attention. I stepped to the railing, and the sea was vast and smooth in the moonlight. There were shapes out there, like water buffaloes sleeping. And strangely, they reminded me of India, where I was stationed for so many years. I would see the buffalo in the fields when I was returning from a dance in Madras. Even then I kept to myself, an observer only, of the talk, the whirling of the dancers, the social rights of my own class, the governing class. I would think that our world sometimes felt as foreign to me as those of the people we were governing. And it was the same on the ship. For all that I was a stiff old bachelor, I could see the pretenses the men and women made in order to touch, often someone else's spouse. But I remained apart, an outcast at life's feast. I am apart still. I have wondered if there were others like me. Spinning into rain clouds, falling to the sea. I listened for them. I tried to call to them, though I had no voice. If I'd had words then, perhaps I could have called out to the others who had gone down with the Titanic, and they would have heard me. But as far as I knew, as far as I know now, I am a solitary traveler. More tea? Yes, thank you. If you were skeptical about the Titanic, why did you sail on it? Well, I was anxious to get back to New York. I went to London to attend the convention of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, the English edition of our own National American Women's Suffrage Association. We were striving for the rights of women, to vote, to travel alone, to be individuals. I suppose these things have been achieved now. Hmm. Well, some of them. Some places. The convention had led to a protest in the streets. We had marched to Trafalgar Square, and, and the crowds had lined up, but they had mostly jeered us, and, and the bobbies had ringed us in and, and prodded us gently with their sticks and isolated us in small groups and then talked to us as if we were children. There were some angry words and... And there were a few latchings onto gas lamps and iron fence posts. And some arrests and, uh, and a few flash fingernails. And then we drifted away. It was important to make the effort, though, surely. Oh, yes, but to be honest, I grew wary of it all suddenly. I went off to Italy for a while to, to Venice. I sat in the sun, dressed from throat to ankle in a shirtwaist suit, and I read... And I spoke to no one. At night, I would lie on the bed and the window would be open. And I would read some more by candlelight, still in my clothes. One night, there was a full moon and I went out and I wandered the dark paths. And, and suddenly before me was the Piazza San Marco. And it was covered with water from the lagoon. I drew back. The moon and the... And the stars were shimmering out there in the water, like a liquid sky. And I was afraid. I was suddenly conscious of my solitariness there in that place, in, in that city, in, in that country, in the world. I had friends, but we had only ideas between us, and though the ideas were strong and righteous, I, 
I had not yet been naked in Venice, except curled tight in a stone room with a tub of water and a sponge, wiping the scent of my body away, and quickly, never looking at myself. For all my ideas, I was not comfortable in this woman's body. After that first transformation, a cycle began. I was rain, and I moved in the clouds and in the tides, and eventually I became rivers and streams and lakes and dew, and a cup of tea, Darjeeling, in a place not unlike the one where I spent so many years engaged in talk, small and insubstantial, over the tea I was to become. Then I crossed continents, was subsumed in vast seas, and then, in recent times, I rolled in a storm front across a rough coast and rained hard in a new land. I think, in fact, I have arrived in the very country for which I'd set sail in that fateful spring of 1912. Her country. Then what did you do? Did something happen in Venice? No. Nothing happened. I see now, though, that solitude is sometimes a matter of choice and sometimes a matter of fear. And I see now that, that I was so detached from my body that the loss of it almost didn't concern me. All through that night, the fear was never physical. I didn't mind so much giving up the life in my body. The body was never a terribly interesting thing to me except perhaps to draw on the heavy curl of the smoke of my cigar. One needs a body to smoke a good cigar. I sat with many a fine cigar on the veranda of my bungalow in Madras, perspiring gently, fanned by one of the boys. A body is useful for formal occasions as well. I yearn to be clothed now in the evening dress I wore on that night. So I booked my passage home and... And scorned woman though I was, ridiculed for seeking the vote, as soon as I felt the first faint shudder and heard the distant hog cry of the hull, I knew what had happened to this man's ship. I had not expected their arrogance to be so quickly punished. You see the wreck as a form of retribution, then? I don't know. As a kind of justice, perhaps. But when the moment came, I knew what it was. I went up onto the promenade deck, and, and he was there, looking out at the sea. Who? Who was looking at the sea? Well, the man who saved me. The sea was vast. He was tall and dressed in tweeds, and, and he had a mustache. And he was watching the icebergs out there in the calm and moonlit sea, and... I looked out at those sleeping shapes in the water. And I wanted to tell him what I knew. We're doomed now. Not at all. Nothing that can't be handled. This is a fine ship. Well, I'm not in a panic. You can hear that in my voice, can't you? Of course. I just know this terrible thing to be true. Ah, it's the ice you fear. Well, the deed is done, don't you think? What deed might that be? We've struck an iceberg. Then suppose we have. This ship is the very most modern afloat. The watertight compartments make it quite unsinkable. We would perhaps, at worst, be delayed. Are you traveling alone? Yes. Perhaps that accounts for your anxiety. No. It was the deep and distant sound of the collision and, and the vibration I felt in my feet and the speed with which we were hurtling among these things. Yes, I see. And the dead stop we instantly made. And it's a thing in the air. I can smell it. Once when I was a little girl, a, a coal mine collapsed in my hometown. Many men were trapped and, and would die within a few hours. I smell that again. These are the things that account for my anxiety. What was he like? Oh, he seemed stupid at first, in a typical way. He was English and he was stiff, but... He had very nice eyes, which I could see only by moonlight for a long while. But they were soft, really. A woman's eyes. I felt something, a, a sweet feeling. He seemed to really listen. But it's then that he played the fool. He asked me if I was traveling alone, and he tried to blame my fears on that. You shouldn't be traveling alone, if I might say so. No, you might not say so. I'm sorry. You no doubt mean well? Yes, of course. 
I believe a woman should vote, too. Quite. I'm certain you'll have a chance to express that view for many decades to come. Well, the change is nearer than you think. I didn't mean to take up the political point. I simply meant that you will survive this night and live a long time. That's your immediate concern, isn't it? I felt suddenly responsible for her. There was nothing personal in it. But this was a lady in some peril, I realized. And I felt a familiar stiffening in me. The blinkered resolve of my class. The need to dispel the groundless fears of a woman too much given to her intuition. A woman alone could be subject to torments of sensibility such as she was and have no one to comfort her. I wanted to comfort this woman. But she was not the type of woman to take comfort from such words as, here, here, there's nothing to worry about. I felt no resentment at that fact. Indeed, I felt sorry for her. If she wanted to travel alone and vote and not be consoled by the platitudes of a stiff old bachelor from the civil service in India, that it was sad for her to have these intense and daunting intuitions of disaster and death as well. I suppose things are very different now. There are women ship captains. Perhaps even women presidents? <laughs> no, not yet. But at least we got the vote. <laughs> When surely politicians have become more honest and responsive as a result. <laughs> if only. No, I'm afraid some things haven't changed. Intuition is still belittled. Male arrogance lives on. Well, perhaps they were as trapped as we in the end. When I think of this man, when, when I think of myself, it's as if our clothes created the selves we showed to each other. That there were other selves beneath. Is this an eddy through what was once my mind? A stirring of the water in which I'm held? I ripple, and suddenly I see this clearly. My wish to comfort her came from an impulse stronger than duty. I see this now, dissolved as I have been countless years in the thing that frightened her that night. I can feel death in the air, on my skin all over my body. <laughs> you will probably dismiss that as intuition. I am sorry. I expect I seem insufferably pompous. But he listened. He said he was sorry. And he didn't try to reassure me anymore. <laughs> well, that struck me as, as wonderful. I said nothing further to reassure her. And that was an act of respect. I see that now. I wonder if she saw it. There was some other man, I think, who was, who was acting like a fool. I'm sorry. Look here. I filled my glass with ice. It's all over the place. Where did you... Well, it's from the forward well deck and from the iceberg. Mm, I'd never take ice in my scotch and soda. Oh, <clears throat> I do. I looked out to the sea that was even then trying to claim us both, and I finally realized that she was gone. She had said nothing more, not goodbye, nothing. Not that I blame her. I'd let her down somehow. She knew that we were all in mortal peril. I thought his restraint wonderful, and yet I left him. Something collapsed in me as, as sudden and as rock-heavy as the coal mine had once collapsed. It was too late for me. For this man as well. For all of us. All these odd and sweet feelings I was having turned then into bitterness. I couldn't bear to look at him anymore. When I turned back around and found her gone, I had a feeling about her absence. A feeling that I quickly set aside. It had something to do with my body. I did not wish for her return. I wanted only to be lying in a bed, alone in a place I knew very well. A place where I could spend my days being as stiff as I needed to be to keep going. As stiff as I had been all my life at prep schools, men's clubs, in the pulsing heat of India. I wanted to lie wrapped tight as I was once wrapped each night in a shroud of mosquito netting in my bungalow near the Bay of Bengal, with the taste of cigars and whiskey still faint in my mouth, and sleep. 
And now, I feel something quite strong, really. Though I have no body, whatever I am feels suddenly quite profoundly empty. Ah, oh, empty. Ah, oh, quite, quite empty. Um, what was that? Did you hear that? Yeah. I don't know, that's strange. He saved me. This nameless man. With all the wonders I've seen and the losses I've realized since I woke from my long and mysterious sleep. It is this man who... who will not let go of my mind. Well, naturally, if he saved you... It's not as simple as that. What happened? I walked the ship for a long while, and I was among other people, but I spoke not another word. To my shame, perhaps, I, I did not look at the others. I was already dead, it seemed to me. But I found a place where I could stand and watch the sea with no one nearby. A high place near the wheelhouse, I think, and, and unintentionally on a deck with light bulbs. The orchestra was still playing. As time went on, there were sounds of people rushing, crying out. I braced my mind so as not to hear. I stood looking beyond the bow, far into the slick, dark sea, lit bright by the moon. And the air was cold. And I began to shiver. But only from the cold. I knew, not from fear. I did not fear death. I want to think on this place I'm in, on this thrashing above me. But I cannot. There's only the empty space on the promenade where she'd stood. And it was then that I knew for certain that she was right. I knew the ship would go down, and I would die. So I went to my cabin to change. All passengers on deck now, sir. And be sure to put on your life jacket. It's just a precaution. Yes, of course. I'm just going to change. Somehow evening dress seems more appropriate. It's a solemn occasion. Yes, sir. Uh, some of the other gentlemen have done the same. So others knew. I imagine the woman moving about the ship like some Hindu spirit taking human form, visiting this truth upon whomever would listen. I wanted her to have spoken only to me. Something very old and very strong in me brought me to the door of the smoking lounge, with its deep leather chairs and silver-plated ashtrays. This was the only place that seemed familiar to me, that was filled with people whose salient qualities I could recognize easily. Well... It's all up for us. Uh, yes. You can bet rather more freely. Don't encourage him. Right. Have a drink, old boy. And a smoke. Well, the room's still dry, at least, huh? Mm. Yes. Odd. I had been wondering if the matches would be wet. But that's ridiculous. Last hand, everyone. If I'm going to meet my maker, I want to be holding a brandy and soda in a good hand. Hey, what about you, old boy? It doesn't really matter what sort of player you are now. No. Thank you. There is... Someone I must find. Excuse me. No, no, my fault. Sorry. Please get up on deck, ladies and gentlemen, as quietly as you can. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm looking for a woman, a friend. Is there any particular place where I might find Sorry, her? Sorry, sir, madam. I must get up to my post. Check the boat decks. For God's sake, get out of the lifeboat. And look, they've let the third class up. We'll never all get off. Her soul, so much for a new life in America. Please, sirs, let us through. I've got to save my baby. The crew will see to it. There she is. Women and children, no men. Hello. Hello. She turned to face me, and at last I could see her beauty. The delicate thinness of her face, the great darkness of her eyes, made more beautiful, it seemed to me, by the faint traces of her age around them. She was younger than I, but she was no young girl. She was a woman, with a life lived in ways that perhaps would have been interesting to share in some other place. I think she would have liked India, would have liked to turn that remarkable intuition to its days and nights, the animal cries in the dark, and the smell of the Bay of Bengal, and the comfort of a bed shrouded in mosquito netting, 
the drifting to sleep. Can this possibly be me speaking? What is this feeling, this speaking of a bed in the same breath with this woman, when I could express nothing then? You must go into the boat now. Oh, I was about to go below and read. Nonsense. You've known all along what's happening. You must go into the lifeboat. I don't know why. Because I ask you. I don't think I... I spoke another word to him after that. Why... Well, he... I'm sorry, I... I can't seem to frame my thoughts anymore. Oh, of course. You must be exhausted. Well, let's stop for now. May we continue tomorrow? Well, tomorrow is, is hard to contemplate. Today has been hard to contemplate. And I find after so much time, it is difficult to speak. What I must now think of as, as my age expressed itself in writing. I will try to write something for you. Let's see how you feel tomorrow. Goodbye, and, and thank you. you. You can't imagine what this will mean to people, what the Titanic means to people, how important you are. No, I, I can't. Goodbye. What's hard to credit what she says? I am no longer needed. The causes I fought for are obsolete. The freedom's commonplace. It is selfish, but this makes me sad. It would have been better to have died in my own time. The truth I have to reveal now is about myself alone. And Ethan Frome, instead of touching each other, the two lovers decide to kill themselves. There were things Mrs. Wharton seemed to understand. I'm afraid to bathe. The place is so bright and so hard surfaced, but the sense of utter strangeness is starting to wear off. It's the water. It flows so quickly, so profusely. I, I watch it run hard into the tub and. And it seems out of control, and, and I stop the water, and I, I open the drain. And I think of a man whose name I do not even know. It was an act of intimacy. To tell this man I, I did not wish to live anymore. And dear God, he knew what I meant. He knew my heart. I know he knew. And there was only one answer for him to give, a wildly impertinent answer. The only one a lover could give. Because I asked you to. I wanted to say, yes, I, I will live. Yes, I, I will receive this desire from you, and, and perhaps in doing so, I'll, I'll even apprehend at last what that actually means. To live. I was intensely aware of him. The physical presence of him. You've dressed up. To see you off. He had dressed up to see me off. He had adorned his body for the occasion of offering me life, and, and I took that life from him. Accepted it as I would a kiss from him, or, or a caress. Or more. Without a word. And I find myself now... Now frantic with regret. But on that night I could find no other language with which to speak. I had to touch him. But I could not. Instead my hand found his white tie slightly askew and... And I straightened it. <laughs> the gesture of a wife. Of many years. Please hurry. I should have touched him. I should have taken his face in my two hands and, and pulled him to me. And I should have kissed him. 
for there was a kiss yearning on my lips even then, though at the time I, I did not recognize it for what it was. I recognize it only now, nearly a century later. I looked at him and I, I wanted to take him in my arms, but I did not, I could not. I was being a lady. God forgive me. And I wanted him to take me in his arms. But he did not. Though I felt he wished to, I, I felt it on my skin just, just as I'd felt the presence of death. But he was being a gentleman. Last call for life boat. Officer, please board this lady now. This way, ladies. Ladies with the children, this way, last call for life boat. I turned to look at my man, but he was retreating into the shadows. Then the lifeboat began to descend, and, and I was on the sea, in a boat full of women. Our lives spared because of our sex. And I was ashamed. And all I wanted was to be on that deck beside him. And I sank down, and my mind was empty of all ideas. And my body was empty of, of any intent. And after a while, the bow of the Titanic disappeared, and the stern lifted up, and I did not let myself think where he might be. And then all the lights suddenly blinked into darkness, and, and the last tremendous noise rose. The ship cracking in two. And then there were voices all around in the water crying out. And then there was only silence. After she stepped into the lifeboat, I shrank back into the darkness feeling terribly cold, feeling some terrible thing. One would expect it to be fear of what was about to befall me. But it was some other thing. Something that I did not wish to think about. You, you want it? <laughs> come on. Oh, come on. Come on, let's look. A shroud of some kind, like netting, is moving above me. This is silly. <laughs> yeah. There can't be anything there. No, maybe not, but let's look. It strips away, and there are the shadows of two figures there. But it's the figure beside me on the night I died that compels me. I now know that she must have understood what it is to live in a body. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now there are two faces, pressed close, trying to see into this place where I float. I move, I shape these words. I know they heard me when I cried out, when I felt the emptiness even of the spiritual body. They were the ones who thrashed above me. And I know now what it is that I interrupted with my cry. These two above me were floating on the surface of the sea. And they were touching. The winch began to turn and I stepped forward for one more look at her face. But the boat was gone. And my hands came up and they flailed before me and I didn't understand. I went back to the smoking lounge, and the place was empty. I was very glad for that. I sat in the leather chair, and I struck a match, and I held it before my cigar. At the end of the night, I met her. I put my cigar down, and I waited. And soon the floor rose up, and I fell against the wall. The chair was on top of me. And I don't remember the moment of the water, but it made no difference whatsoever. 
I was already dead. I had long been dead. I had stood before her and my arms were dead. My hands could not move. And now, hearing the two above me, I know what it is that brought me to a quiet grief all my corporeal life long. They had known to raise their hands and touch each other. The bow of the Titanic disappeared, and the stern lifted up. And I did not let myself think where he might be. I dropped at once into a sleep as dreamless as death, and, and have I awakened even now? Perhaps I died in the very moment he did. Perhaps I've been assigned to this purgatory for my betrayal. A place to show me that the words must be made flesh. It is many years too late, but I unfasten my dress. I slip from it and, and from all the layers of garments beneath. I shed them quickly, tearing at them, throwing them aside, and, and at last, I am standing naked. And I call to him. I cast the words of my mind out to the distant sea, praying that his spirit has found its way to me and is gazing gazing on this vessel of my body. I am no longer afraid, and soon this hard white sea is, is filled and I step in. <laughs> the water is cold. It takes my breath away. I sit and, and it rises up my thighs, my, my hips, my sides. And it is over my breast. And it is beneath my chin. And, and it ripples there. Like kisses. He is nearby. I slide quietly beneath the water. I will find him. And we will die.